Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Viola. Welcome to this Google Hangout. Uh, I am one of the uh, songwriters uh, that's part of the musical exchange, the Carnegie Musical Exchange, and this whole Hangout thing is um, is uh, one of the activities that that one of the many cool activities that uh, we give we give the um, participants of the musical exchange. And um, yeah, so there's some questions about songs I'm, I'm looking at here in this feed and that you guys have posted all these awesome questions I love and if you're on now and you have questions um, as I'm talking you can just go ahead and post them if you don't know how there's a little if you go to the left of this window there's a little thing and you can click it Q&A and so it's, it's pretty it's pretty awesome but anyway here we go I'm gonna I'm gonna click down these uh, scroll down these um these questions and uh, let's see. So this is this one's from Connor Mahoney, and the question was, "Do you come up with a melody after or before the lyrics are written?" Um, <clears throat> okay, for me, I think it's different for everybody, but it is definitely different for everybody. But for me, um, it depends on the song. So like some songs arrive fully formed, um, ready to walk. And uh, go to school and uh, and figure out who they are. Other songs arrive as a blob, and uh, they wet the bed, and you got to nurse them. And um, so, well, you know, they, they're not a talk; they don't have lyrics. And and sometimes, uh, sometimes it's just like a melodic idea that will come. Brian Wilson used to call them feels, um, and his feels were like a, a melodic idea accompanied with chords. And um, so it all happens different in different ways. And to, the, the trick is to try and complete the songs. And uh, that's really where the craft comes in um, and discipline comes in. And uh, a forum like this is really helpful because your peers can encourage you. So if you're out there somewhere in the world with just you and your songs or you in, like, the start of an idea um, – and you don't have any support uh, or anybody to push you this way or that way or anybody to, you know, encourage you or to actually piss you off to make you finish the song, you probably won't. And, um, but I've always been a believer that we, we all have songs in us uh, if we just we choose to, you know, write them down or sing them or not. And um, so, yeah, the melody and lyrics kind of... It all is different every time, and there's really there's no um, there's no there's no rules or there's no set way. All right, I'm gonna move on. Uh, this one is from Brighton Pruce, I think her name is. She uh, is a student of songwriting, and she's a DJ at Seattle Pacific University. Okay, in Seattle, do you think the most aesthetically pleasing songs are typically very formulaic? Or can one achieve a great sound with a more – oh, crap, where'd she go? Oh, there it is. With a, uh, a more relaxed structure. Uh, I think the structure of the song is important based on what you're trying to do with the song, right? So it's a tricky question, but it's a really good one. If you're trying to get the song on the radio, you need to have a balance between – a formula in something that's never been heard before. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of like hit songwriters, uh, what they'll do is they'll start with songs that already exist or or um, structures that already exist. And it, actually one of the musical exchange exercises, activities that we, we presented a few weeks back was working with um, with the structure and trying to put your own original idea. And some of the ideas were really awesome. And, um, and some of them were good, and then when the peers and some of, uh, some of the songwriters involved uh, chimed in, uh, the students were able to make the songs better, um, which, is, which is really the purpose of this whole song, uh, musical exchange songwriting group. Um, so I personally gravitate towards a song that's, uh, that's going to be kind of complex, because, um, but not like in a way that's, uh, uh, 
I don't I just walked in the room, so I, have to, I can't just ignore her, so I have to hold her up. Sorry. <laughs> she just escaped from the babysitters. Yeah, that's Josephine. Yeah, she just hijacked the whole thing. Um, anyway, I love complicated songs. I also love very, very simple, yeah. very, very simple punk rock songs. Uh, like the Dead Kennedys and the Misfits or whatever. I like I like it all. I love Mozart. If you listen to the Jupiter Symphony, the Andante yeah. section, about three minutes twenty seconds into it, you'll have your mind blown. And also, if you listen to Black Sabbath, like three minutes forty seconds into Hand of Doom, you will hear the greatest singer in rock and roll ever, Ozzy Osbourne, and some of the best lyrics. Um, so it, it I run the gamut. Um, and I don't think um, – I think it really depends on what the song is, is being used for. That's really the answer to that question. Okay, very long convoluted, but that's what you get when you talk to musicians in situations like this. Our creative brains hijack um, the other side. Okay, let's see. So here's an excellent question from Rachel Dunn. This question is, what is the best way to make sure – that when writing lyrics, hang on a second, she just scooped that. Where'd that go? Hold on. So all these questions. Uh, when okay, what's the best way to make sure that when writing lyrics, not to write lyrics that just fill up space? Should I just feel it out or separate the melody from the lyrics? Awesome question. You know, John's in the basement mixing up the medicine. I'm on the pavement thinking about the government. You know, it's like. Or, you know, that's great, it starts with an earthquake, birds and snakes and airplane, Josephine. But, um, you know, it, it depends. Again, or this land is your land, this land is my land. So it depends on what the tune is. If it's bugging you, if you're having trouble, like I call it shoehorning a melody or shoehorning a lyric into a, um, a melody and then and sometimes shoe, shoehorning a melody into a chord structure. If you find yourself doing that, uh, and it's and it's it's kind of like and it, you're convoluting your message, you know. Uh, then maybe the best thing to do is to is to weed out the uh, weed out the, the 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 words that are that are kind of not functioning, not helping your song along. One of the big mistakes for a newbie songwriter is using the word and, the word but, cause, and um, another. You know, see that I'd start there, even if it seems like it's gonna help push the song along. Try yanking it out, especially cause, and um, and all of those, and the, but cause, just try yanking them out, and you'll see that like a real mundane line can suddenly reveal itself as something that suggests more than it is um originally originally did. So. That's one way to, to, to do that. Um, let's see. Let's just make sure I answered that right. Uh, or not to write lyrics, it's just to fill up space. Like, well, again, like if you if you find like your melody is, is big or, or long or, or you know slavic, um, and you're like, oh, I just got to write words to fill this up, and then you find that the lyrics that you're writing are more like haiku like or something, then you know maybe the lyrics are for a different song, or maybe you should try. Pulling back the um, pulling back the um, the melody, and maybe you you know maybe that melody can pop up somewhere else in the song. That happens a lot. Like especially as a producer and a songwriter, I'll 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 tell somebody. <laughs> sorry, she's bobcatting my my computer. I'll tell somebody. You know that 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 um that melody is really a bridge. It's not a verse. You know, or that verse should be a chorus. Um, in don't be afraid to, to Frankenstein monster your songs. Don't be afraid to, like, chop them up and rebuild them. Um, I'm sorry. It's man managing little people and dogs around here. So, yeah, that's the answer there. Um, let me see. I'm now looking. I'm looking at other ones. Do, 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 do. Uh, okay. This one's from, uh, oh shoot, I just, uh, oh crap, hold on a minute, I lost you, there I am. Uh, this one's from Cond, a comedy, that's like, I think that's what, what it is. It says, how do I get my music out there? 
other than posting stuff on YouTube? Any suggestions for recording or pursuing a label or a manager? Um, yeah, I don't have any advice towards that. And not because there is no answer or no solution. It's just that I think, you know, if if you if you have some you know, if you have songs that you're really psyched about and you believe in, then the next step is to play them live. And if you can't find a show at the cool club in town and you think all the local bands in your area suck and you're better than them, well, then go prove it and, you know, get a, get a gig at one of the coffee houses or, um, I mean, my first gig was in a rest home, um, convalescent home. So anyway, um, yeah, just get gigs when you can, where you can, and then start collecting fans. And um, build, it, build up a fan base. Build up listeners. If you're young enough, you can do that. If you're older and you're asking that question, um, there, I don't you know, I, same, I get the same answer, but it takes a lot of energy to, 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 to get fans, one fan at a time. Um, so, hey, Paula? Sorry, can you pepper? Um, it takes a lot of energy to get to get uh, fans one fan at a time. Sorry. All right, I'm going to move on to the next one. Here I am in here. Okay. All right, here's one. We're not sure who submitted this question, but it says, what are some ways besides retarding to end a song without being too abrupt? Not sure who submitted Okay. So the answer to that one is really simple. Um, well, you can either fade it out, which is, you know, Brian Wilson, one of the best song American songwriters ever. Um, almost every single Beach Boys song is a fade out. Uh, I can be proven wrong with B-sides. I can be proven wrong with box sets that had unreleased songs. But, but um, every Beach Boy hit was a fade out. I'm almost 100% sure of that. And um, you can fade the song out if, if, it, if there's not a natural ending that you're that you're feeling uh, or hearing, or there are there's something called cadence, right? And the cadence is one chord to another chord, the relationship of the chords in a real simple way to end the song. Oh, actually, I have my guitar right here, so it's all out of tune because Get Who was playing the guitar. You guessed it, Josephine. So uh, one way to end the song is five. If this is one, if you're in the key of G and this is one, one good way to end the song is like if you're is five, which is B. Doesn't that sound like closure? Here we go. So that's one simple, really stripped down, basic way to end the song. But you'd be surprised how many times you can get away with that. Um, so I hope that I hope that helped. Um, retarding is actually a pretty cool way to do it, though. Um, just so you know, but you don't want to do that in every song because that would be a bummer. That'd, that'd be too, um, you know, repetitive. Um, all right, here's a question. We're not sure who submitted this one either. This one says, "Do you think there's a lack of storytelling in mainstream music these days, and how can we as songwriters transform artists' work?" so that it can truly connect to individuals at an emotionally deep level? That's a hell of a question. Because, I mean, that really is you're asking is, how can we be, how, you know, how, how, can we, how can you be an artist? Right? I mean, that's what, we're, what you're asking there. It's like, do I, well, first of all, do I think there's a lack of storytelling? No. Just listen to country radio. Listen to hip-hop. It's all sports. So there isn't at all. Um, how can we as songwriters transform artists' work so that it can truly connect to individuals at an emotionally deep level. That's a tricky thing, you know. It's like for some people it just comes naturally, and for other people it's it's a craft and it's something they learn. And, and uh, so, for our purposes here, I would say, as my friend Dan Wilson once described to me, use plain speak. You know, uh, and, and, and that's that would be if he was sitting here, that would be his advice. And he's totally right about that. And he's been enormously successful using plain speak. And I remember writing with him. He's he's a really bright guy, and and he's got a really agile mind. and can and can conjure up. He's got a great memory and can conjure up ideas really quickly. And 
I remember talking to him and sort of like trying to keep up with him when we were discussing things. But then when we set to write songs, it was always very, always he gravitated towards the simple things that I was singing, never the convoluted or like kind of cool or, or um, alternative things that I would naturally kind of, you know, try and try and I'd be groping for those things. You know, like it's got to be, it's got to be kind of badass or whatever. But he was more into like keeping it something that people could relate to. And um, so I, I would definitely, and since that session with him, which was like probably five years ago, I've, I've always kept that in the back of my mind. It's like, or in my toolbox, you know, of things um, to remember. Like try and keep it plain. If you want to reach a lot of people, use plain speak, you know, and you can infuse it with poetry, of course, and infuse it with original thought. But don't dumb it down. That's a terrible thing. We used to say that in the 90s, like, you got to dumb this down, you know, and th that's just such a turnoff as an artist because who wants to, like, make stupid things, you know, unless you want to make stupid things and make people laugh or whatever. I wrote the song African Child for Get Him to the Greek, so I know about stupid things. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of the that's sort of the answer to that one, I guess. Uh, you know, again, that was really you're asking how to be an artist. I think it's just be fearless in what you're doing. And if you love something, don't be afraid to just be like, that's what I love. If you love Barry Manilow, embrace it. And you may not know who he is because you, you're probably, probably too young to know who he is. But if you love Justin Bieber and you're just a little too old to be loving Justin Bieber but you still love him, love him. Who cares? And that will work its way into your genuine expression that's yours. That's your story that will go out into the world. And that's the way people will respond to you when it's your story. Sometimes you have to start within the paradigm or within the skin, that's kind of gross, of another person that came before you. Like Bob Dylan, it was Woody Guthrie. And he basically inhabited Woody Guthrie's whole thing. He, he didn't steal it, but he inhabited it. Like he, was, he wore like a Halloween costume until he figured out Oh no, he's he's how sixty one, Bob Dylan. You know he's blonde on blonde. He's that guy. And then he reinvented himself a hundred times. But Brian Wilson did the same thing. He inhabited. He just went to the same studios that Phil Spector went to, used the same music, musicians, and um, you know made songs the same way because he just needed a place to start. And within that that model that hero worship, um, he would discover himself. So don't be afraid to like start there too. If you're looking to, especially if you're, look, if you're looking to connect on an emotionally deep level, well then maybe you go and you, you listen to, you know, say it's Sarah McLaughlin or something. I don't know what made me think of her, but like if it's someone like that and she's like, damn, that music reaches me. Go in there and find out what, why. What is it? Is it because she's talking about, you know, life as a thug? Probably not. Is it because she's talking about, you know, Satan, like, spreading his wings? No. What is it? Well, it's, it's simply this, this, and this, and maybe if I sing about these things, I'll connect to people like me. So, and I'll, I'll sing about the Satan spreading his wings and stuff. I'll take care of that for you. Um, let's see. Let me just read down these things. Um, okay. Here's an excellent question from Terrence Peterson. He said, or yeah, do you find a, uh, do you find you get a better response from interesting chord progressions or from more common chord progressions voiced in an unusual way? Awesome, very specific um, question. Really good. Um, uh, I think anything that's like purposely. I think if anything's purposely interesting, like if you're, not anything, but I find with me personally, if I try and make something interesting, I'm going to lose a lot of people that would otherwise be listening to the song, you know, like, or other, might otherwise be drawn into the song. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, um, I think that, like, there's a really there's a balance that I like to strike. I I guess I'll just have to talk about myself right now, and not generally speaking. But for myself, I like to strike a balance um, between crazy chords, crazy lyrics, crazy you know 
vocal range and like also kind of talking, comforting chords, talking, comforting lyrics, familiarity, and also complete abstraction. I like to I like to knit it all together like a crazy crazy like Cosby sweater. Um, but I know that some people are just if I'm writing a song for for an artist with an artist that we want to put on the radio, that we want to get on the radio, um, it's got to be simple. Maybe with a slight variation on the simplicity, it's got to be simple. And like you said, the voicings are a big deal. And where the melody lands, it, it, they call it top line. When it's melody and lyrics, they call that top line. So it's where the top line lands in the chord structure with the beat, how it all relates. Um, tough question to answer. All these are. But that's what's fun about this, about being an artist, about being a songwriter. It's just like, there's no definitive answer. So like, you know, there could be a bunch of you just like, that's crazy. What's he talking about? You know? But, um, you know, it depends. It really just depends on, on what you're, where you, like, it depends like what, you know what rules you're trying to tear down and what and, and rebuild and, and what, what you're trying to remake or make or or just make out of you know thin air. It, 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 if you want to, you know, if, if sometimes I find that this that songwriting is a little bit like like um, summoning, you know, like magic forces. You know, sometimes it is. And sometimes it's just a crock of nothing, but we get lucky. All right, moving on. Well, this is a good one from Con uh, Comedy again. Sorry, I, I, I answered one of the questions from you before, but this one is how do you know how to determine, because this is talking about what we're talking about. How do you know how to determine the right balance between making a song too complicated and too basic? Well, you know, if it's hard to play, so I have this song called Date Night, right? And it goes. Really simple. Just D, E minor 7. Um, whoa. Um, A7 sus, A7, D. But then, I, it was really simple song. You know, it's like love. It's like a, uh, what was it? I gotta get this in tune. Hold on. There's the culprit. To fall, you old girl, thrown a tantrum in a storm, filled with things that we cannot afford anymore. What if there was a magic word you and I simply haven't heard? You and I simply cannot ignore anymore. No one can blame us for being such a fool. After all these years together, call up the city, let's go out to dinner. Everything's gonna be alright. I'm taking you home tonight. Okay? So pretty simple. There's a lot of finger picking. It makes it sound complex, but it's very simple. Except that there's one moment where it's like, uh, I go, I hit this chord instead. So I substituted an A minor 7 
sus or G minor seven add I don't know major seven whatever that would be I'm not sure so and I you know in, intentionally made that a little bit of a uh, 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 like a, a three car pile up because I wanted to delay so it's like what, what if there was an actual word right you and I simply haven't heard you and I simply cannot ignore and then to delay anymore I did the three car pile up and then anymore so Repetition, complexity, simplicity, all kind of woven together. And then the bridge on that song is just like super complex thing that that just I just felt like putting it in there because the rest of the song was pretty simple. So um, how do you know how to determine the right balance between making a song too complicated and too basic? I think you know your gut will tell you. And if your gut isn't telling you, then try it and then ask a friend and see what their gut says. Or do it in front of a crowd and see what uh, what their what their you know guts say. Um, okay, Deidre Struck, who is a doll and an awesome songwriter, she said, "You mentioned having a toolbox while writing. What are some other tools in your toolbox that you haven't brought up yet tonight?" Awesome question. So um, I don't know them at the top off the top of my head, but I'm going to riff on that. And I'm pretty sure I could say one of the strongest tools in my toolbox is a palette. So I'll have uh, notebooks. I'm just I'm in the weirdest spot in my house doing this right now. But um, this is actually pretty cool. I just want to share this. This is a Dracula necklace that somebody gave me for my birthday. Um, but I'll have a palette. So I'll have I write things down. Um, like today I was working with this guy Andrew McMahon who I'm um, producing his record and writing songs with him and he went out to have a cigarette. He went out of the studio to have a cigarette and he was looking and he was texting his friend and he said, meet me at the quality, I'm next to the quality and across the street under the Jack Miranda tree. And then he came in and he's like, am I crazy? Or is this an awesome second verse? You know, and I was like, nay, you're not crazy. That's a really cool thing, but put it in your palette. And he's like, what's what's the palette? And I was like, oh, yeah, it's this. And he's like, I, I, I call it something else. So, like, you know, it's a it's a running list of little ideas, right? Or just not even ideas. They're just things people say. Like, I could tell you I have – what stinks is that now that, like, we're all on – we have smartphones and stuff. I used to have pieces of paper – on in like this, things written on bar napkins, it was pretty romantic. This is pretty boring that I'm going on my phone and doing this. I apologize, but I just wanted to just to show you like here's I call them bitmaps. Forgot about that. Um, <laughs> and there's really funny things in here because it's like you know there's so much mystery in you. I catch myself staring into space. That's something somebody said. I didn't. That's not a song idea. Uh, 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 you know, let's see, 3D heart. It's terrible, but someday that's going to come in handy. Heat tanking. <laughs> uh, motor mouth. Somebody said motor mouth. I'm like, oh, that's an awesome name for something. You erase me. I like that one. Anyway, so palette's a good one. Um, uh, in my toolbox also, like, if... One of the things I always strive for when I'm collaborating, I insist upon, is nouns and verbs. Because nouns and verbs really push the story forward and push the in They suggest more than just explaining things and describing things. If you just say what they are instead of describing them, most people will attach descriptions to them. So if you say screen door, you know, screen door slammed, Mary's dressed wave. You know, Bruce Springsteen, you say screen door slammed. You know, it's so much more powerful than, like, the white screen door slammed. Because you can picture your own screen door, you know? And um, I don't know, I just, I, that's one thing. That's I wouldn't really call that a tool. That's more of a rule, but that's another one. Um, that's all I can think of right now. But good question. I should write those down. Um, 
This one says, do you have any special routine? Okay. Well, this one's from Kathleen Lifers, I think, or Leifers. Do you have any special routine you use when you write a song? Any specific things that help you work through a song? I don't have a routine, but one of the things, but I have, like, remedies. <laughs> uh, so, like, if, if, we're, if I'm writing, if I'm collaborating with someone, and we keep hitting the same wall over and over, then I just tear down the wall. So if it's like, you know, a rhyme is, is usually one of the biggest culprits, right? If you're having trouble rhyming um, love. Love is a, is a hard rhyme. Um, glove, above, you know, of, all sorts of things that have been done a million times. Yank it out. Yank it out. Find another way to say love. And, or, and then use love somewhere else where it's super strong, where it's like in the middle of a phrase, or it is the actual phrase, like all you need is love. He never had the rhyme love. I remember when I was working with Dan Byrne on Furry Walls for Get Him to the Greek, and we had trouble rhyming walls. This is a hilarious little thing, but we had trouble rhyming walls. And it just was like, God damn it, every time we get to the thing, we have to halls, balls, like what, what, we have nothing more over here. Um, calls, talls, malls, it was dumb, really stupid. And the song made me stupid, but like good stupid and, and rocking. And, um, and it was actually Dud Apatow who uh, was the producer of Get Him to the Greek who, who we were texting with during that, and he's just like, you guys are overthinking this. Don't rhyme it. Just say furry walls, furry walls, furry walls, furry walls. Just keep saying it. It's a hook. Totally right, 100% right. And that's, he's not even a songwriter. Uh, but he, you know, he knew how to get to the heart of the idea. So I think, uh, I think that's an important, uh, an important thing to remember. Um, let's see. I lost my train of thought. The choo-choo went off the tracks for that one. Sorry. Um, Let's see. I'm going to go to the routine. Oh, that was the routine. Any specific thoughts? Oh, yeah, that's what it was. I was answering that one. So, um, yeah, so the routine would be just tear down the wall. Very well. <laughs> no, tear, tear it down. Um, and, and we don't have to rhyme that. Let's not ever rhyme that. We don't have to worry about it ever again. So that that's, um, that's one thing I definitely do. Another thing could just be like... Uh, Ramp up. Like if you're having, if you're stuck on the second verse, this happens very, very common. It happens a lot. If you're stuck on the second verse, try ramping up. Like don't start from the chorus into the second verse and like be like start from the beginning. Have patience because if your song is great, you know you're gonna be hearing it all the time. So you, you better you better love what you you know what you've done. You should always just like, do the work. Start from the beginning, work your way up to the second verse. Don't just jump in. Don't parachute in. Ramp up. That's another routine. That's, I always do that. And a lot of times with, in this digital age we're living in, um, young engineers will often start sessions like, you know, they'll, they'll loop a section of a song to work on it. But I'm not a fan of that at all. And um, I think it's destructive. I think the best way to do it is like rewind the tape, you know, and go to the beginning. So that's another. That's another little thing I did that's pretty specific. I start at the beginning of the song when I'm working on it. Um, okay. Um, let's see if I can find somebody. That I... Okay, this is from Carolyn Kelly, who says, What are your opinions on mixing chords and picking or more folky styles with bar chords. What are your opinions on mixing chords and picking or more folky styles with bar chords? I guess what you mean is like, what are my opinions on like, like when you know presenting the song? Is that maybe what you mean? All right. Well, here's another. I can give you another exactly actual example rather. So I wrote this song. Oh God. I saw my file on that uh, Google Hang. He tuned his guitar the whole time. It was great. So I had this song that was like, 
It's like, blame it all on Mojo filters, suicidal rock roll. Blame it all on, like that. And then I was like, ah, I gotta, it's not really, it's just blame it all on monkey fingers, suicidal rock roll. Blame it all on Mojo filters. Even if it kills you, you and I have to do that, you know? It was like that, right? And I was like, yeah, it's cool, but maybe a more folky approach, a more finger-picking approach will expose the nuances of the lyrics in because the rhyme scheme's a certain way, and so then I changed it to Blame it all on monkey fingers, suicidal rock and roll. Blame it all on mojo filters. Even if it kills you, you and I have been through that. We know each other well. You and I have been through that. We know each other well. You and I have been through that. We know each other well. You and I have been through that. We know each other well. So, you know, just to. It's just exposed more in that particular song, in the lyric, and in the melody, and was more pleasing. So um, I chose to finger pick it. So I think you you serve the song. My opinion is, uh, you serve the song you're playing. And if you need to have a stomp box, a distortion box, and you need to be just playing very slop, sloppy bar chords, uh, you know, I want to be sedated would not sound very good if it was like. Twenty, twenty, twenty-four hours to go. I'm on the piece of dated. I want dated. Yeah, I don't like that. I'd rather, you know. 20, 20, 24 hours to go. I want to be so it depends on the song. you got to serve the tune. Because these eighth notes serve the melody better, right? So check this out. I'm not just trying to show, like, this crazy contrast between finger picking and punk rock. This really is a good example because 20, 20, 20. See that? They're eighth notes, and the melody is an eighth note. So it's reinforcing your hook the whole time. 20, 20, 24 hours to go. Is, but if you like trying to be all cheeky, 20, 20, 20, it's like, well, where, where's that melody landing? 20, 20, 24 hours to go, I want to be sedated, nothing to do, nowhere to go. You know, I don't, it, it, it's way more effective. So you take that into consideration, and, it, and if somebody like a producer or a friend or a player or your drummer is like, hey, can you try, you know, playing that guitar part? or that piano part, you know, can you strip it down and play like, you know, instead of, take them up on it, try it, you, you might, your song might win at the, in the end, all right, um, let's see, trying to find another one, okay, here's a, here's a, Here's, a, here's one from Brighton Proust. I think I've already answered from, one from you, but maybe not. It doesn't matter if I repeat. I'm just, I'm just scrolling randomly through these through your, your guys' questions. Um, hang on one second. Where would that go? I just lost it. Here it is. All right. How can one place themselves in a position to be able to write music from multiple genres? How can one really get a songwriting publishing deal? Is that not a smart move anymore as technology is so accessible and one could be a songwriter independently? Okay, you can't do anything by yourself. Every once in a while people do, and that's great. You need a team. You need help. And the place to start is your local cafe, your local venue, and start playing. Because if you're any good and your songs are good, people will respond. And if you're just a songwriter and uh, you don't perform, then what you need to do is hire someone to sing and produce your demos if you believe in the songs that much. But before you go spend money on that, um, I would advise that you know you get some opinions from some people. And that's, musical exchanges are really excellent 
venue for this, but there's no surefire way to do anything, um, and there never was. So, like the idea of like is technology, you know, technology is so accessible and one could be a songwriter independently. No, that's not definitely not. I mean, you, you, it's a a lot of it happens by yourself, but these days most most times it happens with the team in a group. So like you have managers and a and people and producers and artists that all kind of, you know, there's like teams of people doing these things. Uh, and uh, and how can one really get a songwriting and publishing deal? I mean, you know, it depends. Again, sorry, but like it depends. Like if you if you, it's this. It's not. It's like kind of asking like how do you, how do you win the lottery? And it's like well, you could buy a bunch of scratch tickets, you know, or you can you could play the numbers all you know, until you have no money left or whatever, and maybe you'll do it. But the resources you'll be exhausting, writing songs is inexhaustible. Um, the resources you'll be using trying to pursue a publishing deal is finite because you don't, there's not a game to it and there's not a strategy to it. Um, you have to put yourself in front of people. If you go knocking on the door at EMI, Sony ATV, or uh, Cobalt, or you know songs or small publishing companies, um, it's just not going to happen that way. And if you send them stuff, they're not going to listen to it. They're just not. I don't think people really ever did. I think that like even back in the Tin Pan Alley days. There's an awesome book. I wonder if it's here. No, it's, it's I loaned it to somebody, but uh, there's an awesome book called I recommend this book to everybody watching. It's called I think it's called There's Magic in the Air. And it's about the Brill building, about Tin Pan Alley. And I suggest you read that book. It's so awesome. Just just it 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 depicts how fierce these how fiercely competitive People like Neil Sedaka and Carol King and Paul Simon and Neil Diamond and and uh, uh, you know all, all the all the great Tim Pan Alley writers um, um, how they how they were fiercely competitive in their demos they spent money making demos but before they did that they tested their songs on their family like is this good your family will be hopefully my family was always pretty brutally honest you know. And my wife is to this day. I'm like, is this any good? And I'll ask her, and she's usually 100% right. Like, you know, um, and if she doesn't like something, it's because it might be too niche for her, um, which usually means too pop. Um, she likes it when things are a little edgy. But um, so um, yeah, I think get, get play writing the songs, getting if you can't sing them and play them, get somebody to sing them and play them, make a tape or a video of it, um, share that. With people, get feedback in, in, from people that you trust, and uh, this online community is a really an excellent source of that. And just start taking the hits, start getting the, the hits to the face, and you're building up the thick skin, and then see what happens next. But there, unfortunately, there's no story it's like strategy I could give you. Like what you need to do is this, and anyone that really says that, um, God, I'd like to talk to them. So let's see, what else do we have here? Um, okay, Rosalind, uh, Rosalind Schlafman asked, what's the best way to start writing a song when you are having trouble? Um, sometimes the best thing to do is to just throw it out. If you're having trouble finishing it, put it in on the back burner. Put it in your, your satchel. And either use some of the bits for another song, or one day that song will come back and tap you on the shoulder and be like, "Oh yeah, remember me? Here I am. You ready? Are you ready to finish me now?" And, and you might be that day. Um, but before you do all that, I would definitely take a deep breath and try and look at the song, like if the song is a house, right? Don't walk into the front door like you own the place because it's not your house. Try and find another way in. 
Sometimes it's the bedroom window, sometimes it's the bathroom window, sometimes it's the basement, you know, bulkhead. So sneak into that house. Climb down the chimney if it's a Christmas song. Um, don't ever forget that it's the hardest thing in the world to create something out of nothing. It takes fearlessness, like as I've said before. It takes danger. And Ellie Greenwich, when she was a little girl in New York City, was a dangerous... The woman who wrote Be My Baby was a dangerous, menacing, beautiful, gifted, hard-working person. So you can't approach the arts and things like songwriting, which, you know, you can't approach songwriting as with a tender, you know, with, 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 you can't be too much of a softy, which is hard because most of us are, because that's, that's why we want to start expressing ourselves, because we can't say shit anyway. So we're trying to express ourselves through music or through paintings or writing. So it's hard, but this, it's hard to, to, you know, kind of, it's difficult, rather, to start, like, getting these, get, being thick-skinned about it. But it's like playing guitar, you have to have calluses to really be able to do it. And I think songwriting's the same way. And never forget, too, that it's a muscle. So if you're just doing it on Sundays, just for the hell of it, and you just, like, it's a hobby, that's cool, that's completely fine. But don't expect too much from it. But if you're really taking it seriously and you want it to be, if it is your lifeblood, maybe it's not paying the bills right now, but if it's the reason why you get up in the morning, you have to remember just to write all the time. Tennessee Williams wrote every day, every day of his life, he woke up, no matter how hungover he was or who was in bed next to him, it didn't matter. He'd write every day. And some of his best plays came out of those, you know, they weren't even short stories. They were just kind of like my bitmaps. They were just like, well, not they were more than that. They were, they were, it was more than that because he would, well, like journal entries, really, but he would, there was form to them. And then later that he made them into short stories. And there's a great, I recommend this book too, The Collected Short Stories of Tennessee Williams. There's all the great, like the Rose Tattoo, Streetcar Name Desire, and they all spawned from these short stories. And he worked every day at it. Um, Stephen King's another one. He works every day writing. On Writing by Stephen King's a great, a great book to check out too. Um, so yeah, I just say. If you're having trouble, you might need to toss it, but don't just stop. Just try another, try another idea, and that one will come back to you. It will. Paul McCartney is still making records based on cassette tapes, reel-to-reel tapes actually from the '60s. That he, you know, he has these little song ideas from Sgt. Pepper that he's still like, damn, that was good. I was like fertile back then, and he still poaches from it, and because they're his ideas and they're old, but he just. He still can relate to that, the kid brain. So that's the answer to that. Um, okay. All right. This one's from Kendra Bragg, and she asks, um, most people tend to agree on moving to Nashville. New York City or LA in order to succeed as a songwriter. How do you recommend circumventing this in continuing to forge ahead with one's career despite a less than ideal location? Um, if 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 you're not done honing your if you're if you're not done honing your craft, stay where you are. You don't need to be here. I'm in Los Angeles right now, and I I come from New York. I live there for you know, almost 20 years, and from there I was in Boston, so I was always in like a bigger music town, but it didn't matter that I was in Boston, I never was really in that music scene anyway, because I hadn't honed my craft until I was, I, I was a late bloomer because um, of the way life, you know, the way my life ended up. I, I really, I, I started very young, but I didn't really get down to, to business of like learning my craft until well into my 20s. So um, I, would, I would recommend staying where you are, for sure, don't just move to LA or Nashville or New York because, you know, it's where the music business is. But if you're ready to do music business, you got to move to the music cities or be willing to travel. Um, I have a friend that lives in Vermont, and um, he's a, he was in a very successful band in the 90s, 
and he lives in New Vermont. He has a big house, a big yard. But I see him eh, at least three times a year. He flies to L.A. and he has a family out there. But he comes to L.A. to do his business. So it's true that that's where the business is in those three cities for the most part. But you know, labels like Saddle Creek, you know, they exist basically. Uh, you know, what used to be off the map. You know, and there's tons of little music scenes all over the country that I, whenever I travel, I'm surprised. Like, wow, this is cool. Like, you know, I, you really don't have to be in a major city. But if you want to do business, meaning like, you know, if you want to be seen in front, uh, if you want to put yourself in front of people that, that might see you and respond to you in a professional way, you might, you're going to need to like travel to New York or LA or Nashville to do that. Pick up an open mic night. Again, if you're a performer, I know some of you aren't. Some of you are just writers. Um, but that's one thing for sure. And I, you know, if you're just a writer and you're not a performer, um, yeah, don't move to LA, Nashville, or New York. It's not going to matter. Uh, let's see. How can you make sure your song is original and you didn't copy anyone lyrically or musically? That's from Rosalind Schlafman. Um, I think the rule is eight bars. If it's eight bars of plagiarism, then it's litigious. But um, my rule is a little bit easier, less mathematical. If you feel like it's someone else's song, it probably is. Or, if you feel like it's someone else's song, play it for some people. Play it for a lot of people and just make sure. It's that simple. When Paul McCartney woke up um, on a blustery winter, winter morning, and he was living in the attic of uh, Peter Asher, who was Jane Asher's brother. Peter Asher was in a band called Peter and Gordon, went on to produce James Taylor Records and be a record executive here in Los Angeles and is a great guy. He's got a crazy mop of red hair still. And, and Paul McCartney lived with him during the Beatle mania, like heyday. And um, he woke up in that attic in the bed in a room right next to Peter Asher, and he came up with Yesterday. And it was Scrambled Eggs when he first wrote it. It was literally called Scrambled Eggs, and it's a well-known well -known, uh, fact about that song, I think, at this point. But anyway... He thought it, it was somebody else's song. He was sure it was, uh, you know, a Cole Porter song or something. And he played it for and his dad. Uh, Paul McCartney's dad was a um, was a um, professional musician as well. And he played it for him. And his dad's like, I've never heard it, you know. And he played it for a lot of people. And it turns out he had written that song. So, but he really thought he was like, this cannot be my song. But indeed, it was. And um, thank God he came up with yesterday instead of scrambled eggs. There's an awesome video online of Jimmy Fallon and Paul McCartney um, singing scrambled eggs. <laughs> it's really good. All right, let's see. Okay, Rachel Dunn asks, asks, asks an awesome question. Is becoming a mere, uh, I'm sorry, is becoming a more advanced instrumentalist more, is, one more time. Take two, take three. Is becoming a more advanced instrumentalist important in becoming a better songwriter? Or is just knowing at least basic guitar or piano, etc., good enough? You don't need to know much. Duke Ellington, no, not Duke Ellington, uh, George Gershwin only played black keys and had a specific piano built for him so he could just change keys. It was levers that moved the hammers. True story. So, um... No, you, you don't need to be a virtuoso because that's the thing. If, you, if you've studied to be a virtuoso and you've, you've gone down that road and maybe you play violin and maybe you're really, really good at it and you have and you want to um, and you want to start writing songs, the virtuosity of being a violin player is not going to apply to being a great songwriter. Um, it, it'd be, you'll probably look awesome playing live, and, but yeah, as far as the craft goes, you really don't need much. Um, so that's that. Hang on one second. Um, okay, I have one or two more questions left. My moderator just told me that. Yasmin. Um, so I'll ask. I'll answer. I think one more question. I think I have three minutes left here. 
Let's see if I can just go down and find something. <laughs> Of course, I'm going to spend all my time looking for one, right? Uh, toolbox. Okay. Um, uh, this one is good. Okay. So this is a simple. This is again from Khan to comedy. Um, this is just an easy question to answer with because now I, I realize I only have three minutes, but. Um, in the future songwriting activity, where it says you have to collaborate with someone in order to create a song, can it be a friend of yours, or does it have to be someone in the exchange? Um, uh, I believe it. I believe it needs to be somebody in the exchange. I believe that's the idea, um, but I could be wrong. The best thing to do is to email or to to post a message to Yasmin. Um, she'll know for sure. I can't. I, I can't remember to be honest with you. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap this up. It's been really fun doing this. Um, I know Deidre Struck has one coming up that we'll all be attending and, and checking out. Um, I wish I had that date at my fingertips. I don't, um, but uh, if you've attended this, you probably will be getting some sort of invite or something from Yasmin. But um, this has been really great, and I wish you all well. And um, Finishing those songs is not as hard as you think it is. Maybe you just got to weed some stuff out. Weed some stuff out, get to the point. What is that song trying to do? Where's that song trying to take you? Let it take you there. Okay? And don't worry about sounding too simple. Don't worry about sound, sounding too complicated. If it feels right, give it a shot. I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to sign off now. So.